and our other presenter, who is also the author of some of the early forestry short course, Mickey McNaughton, is currently serving as a special project coordinator for the Washington State Department of Natural Resources in their urban and community forestry program. She's managing an urban forestry restoration pilot project. She also works through her own consulting firm, Arboria LLC, which specializes in helping communities to achieve the maximum potential from their urban forest through enhanced planning and programming at the local level. Mickey has been an urban forestry planning specialist with the Washington State Department of Commerce and an urban forester with the city of Olympia. She's a certified arborist and a municipal specialist and a graduate of the Municipal Foresters Institute as well as the Pacific Northwest Community Tree Management Institute. She's a contributor to Tree Protection on Construction and Development Sites, a Best Management Practices Guide for the Pacific Northwest, and also wrote a Citizens Tree Care Manual as an educational outreach tool for local communities. Mickey is a member of the International Society of Arboriculture, the Pacific Northwest Chapter of the ISA, the Society of Municipal Arborists, and the Planning Association of Washington, where she serves as the secretary to the Board of Directors. And she's also the Puget Sound Regional Education Coordinator for the Pacific Northwest ISA. So she's a very busy woman, and I'm glad she could accompany us today to be here. Uh, I'm Mickey McNaughton. Uh, I'm not nearly as funny as he is, so bear with me. I am, however, very passionate about urban forestry and the place that it holds in making our communities truly vital, truly livable, and sustainable for the long term. We were having a conversation at supper tonight about plazas in Italy and public spaces in Europe that incorporate trees in a way that really makes sense for the population. And those cities are far older than anything we have here. We should be taking a page from them. Urban forests are the trees where we live. It's not the trees we go visit and we go hike through, although sometimes we get to do that in cities like Bellingham. It's the trees where we live. It's the trees where we play, the trees where we work. It's, they're very important to not only the quality of our life, but whether we can actually sustain life in our urban areas. Paul has talked a lot about um, some of the elements of the comprehensive plan. As we go through some of the special things that trees do for us, think about how every one of those benefits and services ties into the elements that he mentioned earlier. And he's going to come back later this evening and kind of tie it all together in a pretty package. But uh, just bear in mind that Every one of the benefits and services that we're going to talk about first are things that directly tie into the elements that are important to our planning processes in our cities and urban communities. So what do trees do for us? We're going to talk about that in more detail. What are some of the regulations and programs that are available to help support urban forestry? Um, infrastructure planning. And here I'm going to ask you to sort of switch gears and think about trees not as the pretty packaging in our communities, but as an integral infrastructure element. And then I'm going to tie it together with something that we can all do immediately to make an immediate difference, and that's a plan review checklist. This is a 10-point checklist that I developed when I was working for the City of Olympia so that as I look at plans, I could think in a logical fashion about whether the trees were actually in the right place and they were the right trees to perform the tasks that we were asking of them. So, why trees? Well, they're pretty. Uh, one of the things I like to do with school kids is, uh, you're going to take a deep breath. Deep breath. Come on. I'm not here. <laughs> okay. If you can breathe oxygen, you better go have a tree. That's why we can breathe air on the planet Earth. It, all plants contribute to that, but by their mass, trees are the critically important part of that equation. They perform a lot of other services for us, too, and I'm going to go through a few of those. In your handout that I hope each of you have gotten, there, on the third page, there's actually a list of, I think, about 23 benefits and services that I could think of sort of off the top of my head with a few really supporting statements. On your resource handout, in the first 
uh, page or two of your handout are some websites and books that provide some of the supporting documentation for those claims. And there's more coming out all the time. Uh, I'm going to mention at the federal level the research organization, an arm of the U.S. Forest Service, that specifically does research on the services and benefits that urban forests and urban trees provide for us. But first and foremost, um, we have the fact that healthy trees can help communities meet the goals that they have set for themselves in terms of sustainability and economic vitality. Here you have you know, a fairly typical main street or main corridor in an urban area with some trees way off in the background. Trees are a powerful and versatile tool in a community's development toolbox. They can save energy, as this illustration points out. They save energy because if they're properly sited on a location, they can block the wind in the winter. They shade in the summer, providing a, a reduced energy demand. Uh, they actually sequester CO2, so they take up carbon and lock it into their structure. Again, all plants do this to a certain extent, but by their very mass, their size, trees do this to a much greater extent. Here we have an illustration of evergreens blocking north winds in the winter, reducing the wind chill factor and deciduous trees that shade in the summer or reduce the need for air conditioning. Uh, trees can be a more cost-effective and more attractive alternative uh, as a solution to a lot of the challenges that cities face rather than hard engineered so solutions. Uh, one of the places that we see trees being uh, very useful is reducing the heat island effect in cities not only through their shade, but also through the transpiration of moisture through the photosynthetic process. Uh, pavement. Pavement, uh, the lifetime of pavement can be extended by a factor of 15 to 20 percent through shade. Trees providing shade reduces solarization, reduce the volatilization of the uh, tar oils and asphalt, and can uh, extend the timeline for resurfacing. When you start talking in terms of dollars and cents to your city council, they start listening. When you can start proving that having a good healthy canopy over your city provides all these additional benefits that give you a longer budget timeline for critical infrastructure, now they're starting to pay attention. And this is where urban forestry traditionally has not made a big impact. We're very good at the operations side. We know how to take care of trees. We know how to plant them properly. We know how to prune them properly. Ah, but we don't really yet have a good grip on how to plan for them properly. So I'm very excited to be here tonight, kind of sharing with you my vision of how this might happen. Stormwater is a huge issue right now for all cities. We've seen floods throughout western Washington and other parts of the country as well. This gives you four different types of functions that uh, urban forests can help provide in terms of stormwater management. Uh, the uh, EPA in particular is really getting strong about this, and we'll see a little bit more about that later. Health and well-being of the city's population. Another big arena for urban forestry. Very pleasant walking. Bellingham has great walking trails. Trees sh provide shade that reduce the UVB radiation. UVB is one of the great uh, contributors to most of the common forms of skin cancer. Uh, it's been proven that children with ADHD actually are calmer in well-treated locations. Patients heal faster. All of these have a considerable amount of research behind them. Economic vitality, another big driver these days. Work by Dr. Kathy Wolf at the University of Washington has uh, determined that well-grown, healthy trees in a shopping arena can increase the revenue by as much as 20%, but more typically right around 11%. Uh, theory is that the area is so much more pleasant that people spend more time there, 
they window shop a little bit more, they, you increase, I believe they call it in marketing terms, the residence of the shopper on that site, thereby increasing the possibility and potential for sales. Trees are also a great traffic calming device and provide for pedestrian safety by um, delineating very clearly the lanes of vehicular traffic and providing a buffer between pedestrian lanes and vehicular lanes of traffic. They increase property values. You can actually go online to a lot of the realty, uh, national realty organizations and they will tell you that if you have good landscaping, well-grown, beautiful trees on your site, you can ask 15 to 18% more as a selling price. Eh, that's not too bad. And community values. Trees are well known as a community builder, both in the planting and the care of them. Also, providing a location for picnics and games. Uh, the uh, community crime, excuse me, crime prevention through environmental design organization at the national level had, is actually involved in a long-term 25-year study in Baltimore to look at trees as a, an element in crime prevention and reduction program. That was a new one for me when I first heard their presentation. Uh, when you talk to most policemen in most local communities, trees are a bad thing. However, SEPTED has done studies that indicate that because people are more inclined to be on the street in a, in a well treated community, it's pleasant to be outdoors. It smells good, the air is cleaner, uh, there's shade, the community gathers in a park, for instance, because there's more people roaming around the area, there's less crime. Because there's more eyes on the street, there's less crime. That was a new one on me, but I really like the idea. And when you combine all of those benefits, and here's a great thing, trees are not a single use tool. They're sort of like the saws all of your community development toolbox. They do everything, and they do it pretty well. If you add all of the benefits together, this is just a little look at what Pittsburgh came up with when they did their analysis of their inventory. Their total benefits are almost two and a half million dollars. Okay, city council is listening to this. And these are just the top five tops and types of benefits. And you'll notice that aesthetic is a big one. People like living in pretty places. Um, recently, I heard a gentleman from Smart Growth give a presentation, and he said, we used to say that people moved places for jobs. He said, we don't find that anymore. People move places that they want to live. It's a place they want to live. How do you make your community a place people want to live? A lot of times, nowadays, with uh, internet access, they'll bring their jobs with them. But you need to make your place attractive for them to make the decision to become part of your community. Trees are the only city asset that increases in value over time. There is no other city asset that does that. And that drives accountants crazy. Regulations and programs. Okay, there's not a lot of regulatory structure around trees and urban forestry until you get very close to the local level. There are some programs, however, that support urban forestry throughout the entire structure of federal on down. So there's federal programs, state programs, regional, county, and local. Okay, at the federal level, we have the US EPA and the Smart Growth Program. That's probably one of the best um, it boosts that urban forestry has gotten in a long time because they really started incorporating urban forestry principles into the Smart Growth Program and particularly into their um, water quality scorecard. There's a whole section, section one, pages 17 through 20, that has all to do with your, the city's trees, where they're located, how they function, their health, uh, very powerful uh, in terms of making, especially engineers that are dealing with hardscape, hard engineer type solutions, make them, help them understand the power of trees. 
this is just an illustration of how urbanization affects the hydrologic cycle. And that, again, is a huge factor in what trees can help do in a city. When you get a lot of hardscape, there's no place for the water to go. We can use a lot of techniques, uh, stormwater retention ponds, uh, permeable concrete, permeable asphalt, roof gardens, wall gardens. There's all sorts of techniques that help. Trees can help as well. Certainly trees aren't the full answer to everything, but they can certainly support a suite of answers to every challenge. This is the section I was referring to, section 1C in the uh, water quality scorecard, tree protection. And that's a three-page section. It's one of the biggest sections in the entire water quality scorecard. I was very impressed. The U.S. House of Representatives uh, had a bill introduced in 2009 by let's see, Representative Pepper Schwartz uh, from Pennsylvania. It was called the Green Communities Act. Uh, it has now been in committee since May of 2009, so I don't anticipate we're going to see a lot of action out of it, but I do like to mention it because there is some activity at the national level to acknowledge the part that urban forests and urban trees can play. Probably the most powerful partner at this point in time at the federal level is the U.S. State Forest Service. There is an urban and community forest program at the national level. Jan Davis is the um, assistant director for the Urban and Community Forestry Program. Uh, they, in turn, then have state programs located in every state. There are two people in every state two urban foresters statewide. It's a lot of responsibility for just two people. Uh, and we, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about who that team is here in the state of Washington when we get to the state programming. The National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council is the research arm that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the NUCFAC, as they're called, NUCFAC grants are big grants, 50 to $60,000 and above, that focus on research around urban forests and urban trees and their role in our modern lives. Lots of good work being done. In the state, we have the Washington State Department of Natural Resources Urban and Community Forestry Program. I'm currently under contract to them as a uh, special project coordinator. And uh, I could burble on for hours about the brand new urban forestry restoration pro project that we have going on. So catch me at break and I'll talk more about that. Uh, at the state, we do have two people permanently in that position. I am just a project position. We have the program manager, Sarah Foster, who directs all of the programming for the state urban forestry program. And we have Lyndon Lampman, who is the uh, community assistance forester and offers uh, technical assistance to local communities of all types within the state. There is a grant program that they manage, uh, money that comes from the U.S. Forest Service that is um, given to communities that apply for certain project funding. The Washington State Department of Ecology has a variety of programs and manuals that are available that incorporate trees and urban forestry into their guidelines. Uh, most famously, again, the stormwater management manuals, which have just been revised in the last year, uh, and incorporate much more about green infrastructure and green infrastructure planning and programming. Low impact development guidelines incorporate trees, landscaping, um, grade, a certain kinds of grading. This is where rain for um, forests, agree. Rain gardens really uh, are a very strong uh, element in the uh, guidelines there. Critical Areas Ordinances and the Shoreline Management Act do incorporate a little bit about trees and urban areas in as much as most of our critical areas are forested wetlands in western Washington, um, forested steep slopes or bluffs, uh, things of that nature, and Shoreline Management Act concerns also repairing zones that um, lead into shoreline areas. Many of those repairing areas are forested, uh, also, uh, there is some work with the, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife concerning woody debris and woody debris recruitment in urban streams. The Department of Commerce, I worked with Janet for a year, one of the most 
wonderful years of my life um, as an urban forestry planning specialist under the growth management unit. Uh, that's really where I learned a lot about planning and how urban forestry should become part of the planning process. As I said, we have a good handle on operations. We know how to make it happen, but we don't know how to plan it at the beginning. There needs to be a balance. You have to balance planning with operations. You can take excellent care of a tree, but if you don't put the right tree in the right place to begin with, it's pointless. Conversely, you can put the right tree in the right place, have a beautifully planned park, streetscape, public arena, and you're not taking care of it, that's also a waste. They have to come together. There's two parts of that whole. The Evergreen Communities Act. This is why I was hired by Commerce as an urban forestry planning specialist. In April of 2008, the Evergreen Communities Act was signed, and it was designed to support communities that were using uh, urban forests and green infrastructure as stormwater management tools. It unfortunately lost its funding in January of 2009 and has not yet received funding again. It is, however, still an active act. So we like to say that it's merely in dormancy and will spring into full leaf anytime soon. It has the potential to be a really powerful uh, tool again. The Evergreen Communities Act, Communities Act is built on the four standards of the Tree Cities USA Act or program, which is administered by the Arbor Day Foundation. Those four are a tree protection ordinance. Every city has to meet these four in order to become a Tree City USA. It must have a tree protection ordinance. Now, that can be pretty much anything. For instance, Bellingham does not specifically have a tree protection ordinance, but it does have a heritage tree ordinance. That counts. Uh, I work for a very small community, a population of about 725 people. Um, their tree protection ordinance says something along the lines of, we love trees, trees are good, yay trees. It counts, it's a tree protection ordinance. Okay. There must be someone to take care of the trees. That could be urban forestry staff, that could be a tree board. That could be a concerned citizens group or a nonprofit. But there must be some agency within this, the community to take care of trees. There must be a minimum of two dollars per capita uh, as a budget to uh, provide for tree care. And the fourth is the most fun one, and that is you have to have an Arbor Day celebration. And those are just a few. I know I've been to several in this area, and they're a lot of fun. Now the Evergreen Communities Act added for the very basic level, a requirement to have an inventory. That's it built just one step further. The second level of the Evergreen Communities Act would require an urban forestry management plan and on up until you have a fully fleshed out program. We never got that far. We only had nine months. Out of nine months, however, our team did come up with a document called the Guidelines for Urban and Community Forestry Programming. And that is available online. It provides guidelines for building ordinances that protect and enhance the existing urban forest, uh, policy writing guidelines, and uh, some management guidelines as well. If you're interested in it, it is available online, either at the Department of Commerce website or at the DNR website. Regional. At the regional set, uh, level, the Puget Sound Partnership is probably the most powerful partner we have in the Puget Sound area. Many of their um, action agenda items in the 2012-2013 action agenda directly speak to urban forests, forests, trees, forested areas in heavily urbanized areas. And they are not speaking specifically of cities. They are speaking of densely settled areas. And as you know, a lot of times, even outside urban growth areas, there are subdivisions or densely populated areas in the counties. Watershed councils are another powerful partner. Uh, some of them have really stepped up to the plate to help organize planning processes that go from the upper levels of the watershed all the way down to Puget Sound. That's what ideally I'd love to see throughout the state. The watershed councils help us take 
uh, the lead on helping local jurisdictions plan right from the top clear to the toe. We're getting there, but it's a slow process. They are a very powerful partner, though. Regional councils of government. I don't believe there's one in this area or welcome or Skagit County. You do have one. You do have one. Okay, great. I, did, I couldn't find one, so I wasn't sure if, there, if one existed. Uh, again, some regional councils of government have really taken hold of the whole idea of urban forestry, taken it to a regional level, looking at uh, canopy coverage levels, and helping to uh, sponsor uh, grant writing in order to increase canopy coverage in their, their regions. At the county level, yeah, at the county level, we're now starting to see actually some regulatory input into urban forestry. For instance, in Thurston County, they do have a regulation concerning the preservation of significant trees. Significant trees is anything over 16 inches DBH that does not have a timber value. Big A. So pretty much, um, we're talking about the George Washington Bush uh, butternut tree in that case. Uh, most significant trees are of some timber value in Thurston County. Western Red Cedar, Doug Fir, Western Hemlock, Alder. Hmm. So, not a lot of teeth to this one. Uh, Clark Island, Jefferson, Kitsap, Skagit, Snohomish, Spokane counties. They do have county comprehensive plans that incorporate tree requirements into various of their elements. Um, there is not at this time any county that has a specific urban forestry element in its comprehensive plan. I'm working on it, but it's not going very fast. King County has a rural legacy area and resource lands comprehensive plan chapter, which does address forests, non-working non forests in urbanized or densely populated areas. At the local level, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. At least two-thirds of Washington's towns and cities have some form of tree protection code. Many, many more of them address trees in their development code, their zoning code, um, parks protection code, or uh, critical zones coding. Uh, relative to this, getting back to the Tree City USA, um, the state of Washington has the highest percentage of Tree Cities USA for the total amount of uh, legally recognized cities. 87 out of our 287 are Tree Cities USA. We have the highest percentage nationwide. Go us. Development regulations uh, speak to tree protection during construction, tree retention, and street standards appropriate to tree health and function. A standard street section gives trees five feet. Functionally, it gives them four and a half by the time you take away six inches for the curb. So thinking about a street, then a curb, then a five foot planting strip, and then a five foot sidewalk. That's not a big enough space for trees. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because that could take me until two o'clock in the morning to really talk to you about how that works. But as you look at street sections, as you look at plans, while you're learning about these things, think about what it takes for a tree to live. If you try to get a tree to cram its roots into too small a space, it's like you, all of you, trying to wear the shoes that you wore when you were two months old. It doesn't work. You can't walk in them. You can't move in them. Your feet hurt, and you'll fall over. It's kind of similar with trees. Significant or historic tree ordinances, those are very wide, widely distributed statewide. Critical areas and zones ordinances, and I spoke a little bit about that as well. Shoreline management plans as well. So those are some of the places where you might find something relative to urban forestry planning, planning for trees. It won't be called urban forestry planning, but it will incorporate trees in some capacity. Part of your responsibility and part of your education is to learn how to get those trees incorporated wisely and properly 
in that planning process. So we talk a lot about planning, we talk a lot about trees, and I hope that you've seen how much trees contribute to overall infrastructure within a city. So, you know, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, sounds like a duck, maybe it is a duck, so maybe trees walk, talk, sound like infrastructure, maybe we should start thinking of them like infrastructure. That's a huge paradigm shift. Traditionally, trees have been seen as sort of the pretty bow on the package. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll think about trees when, when the building's built, when the park is developed. Then we'll put trees in. Well, what trees are you going to put in? What are your soils? What are your climate? You know, how much space do you have? What do you want it to look like? The time to think about trees is right from the very beginning. That way you'll know that you have thought about the space that they need you will have thought about the types of trees that will do best in those locations. That's the sort of thing you approach when you're talking about planning infrastructure. What are sort of some of the things you think about in infrastructure planning? You think about levels of service. When you talk about transportation planning, you talk about levels of service. Okay, levels of service. Material standards. Do you expect any work in a city without talking about material standards? Same thing with installation standards. Maintenance standards. You don't anticipate that you're going to install a water main and then do nothing. Well, okay, sometimes you do, but you know, you shouldn't. That's not good planning. Inventory and asset management. Every city knows where their water mains are. Every utility company knows where their main lines are. They have an inventory, they manage that asset a work plan and assigned staff, and most famously, budget. So let's take a look at each of these a little bit more in detail. So levels of service. What do we want our trees to do for us? Do we want them just to sit there and look pretty and then fall over in five years because they have no room? Or do we want streets that look like this? What a pleasure to drive down the street like this. Street trees. Park trees. What do we want our park trees to do? Do we want them to frame a view? This is from Wenatchee. Other public areas. How inviting to go to a public plaza like this. And trees on private property, which are also part of the urban forest. Most cities do not regulate trees on private property, but they are part of the overall urban forest tree canopy. Material standards. How do we choose the best materials? Now, there are some guidelines out there. The American National Standards Institute has a standard for nursery stock. Uh, this is extremely boring reading. This is why you hire experts to do this sort of thing for you. But it talks about what constitutes a well-grown tree at any size, all the way from the little seedlings that you may plant on a restoration site to a big six-inch diameter tree that you may bring in as a very special specimen for a celebratory planting. Those standards are all contained in this two-inch <laughs> toad. Inspection. How do you guarantee that you're getting what you specified in the plan? You have to go out and actually check. Enforcement. That's a key one that is not often addressed in any sorts of inspection. And we'll take a little break now.